My role is the very brief one of the institutional welcome. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, it is, uh, I think it's a particularly good time to be visiting the Getty Museum with not only the Andrea Del Sardo show, but also the, one, the bronzes and our displays of medieval manuscripts and other things. So I hope you have time as well as being um, cloistered in this um, symposium to spend a bit of time wandering through the galleries while you're here. Um, just want to say a couple of things by way of thanks and background. Um, also to thank our, particularly our partners at the Frick um, Collection in New York for their, um, for their collaboration on this project, particularly Xavier Solomon and Denise Allen, of course, along with the director Ian Wardropper. Um, here at the museum, we are, of course, delighted that Julian has been able to um, pull together such an extraordinary feat. It's a subject he's been working on, as I'm sure many of you know, for many years. And, um, but, and the fruits of it, I think, are quite extraordinary. The exhibition is absolutely beautiful, as well as instructive. Um, this sort of symposium, of course, it's what we do. It's what you and your institutions do in, um, to, for the, to bring the um, exhibition into connection with the scholarship that's grounding it and to um, hopefully break some new ground and provide new insights into the subject. But it is particularly, I think, worthwhile or doubly worthwhile with a subject of an artist like this who hasn't until recent years received due attention. He's still probably of the great artists of the high Renaissance, the one least familiar to the general public. So an exhibition like this, I think, serves um, a very useful purpose in raising awareness of him and his achievement, um, as well as at the scholarly level. Um, so I'm sure this is going to be an extremely fruitful um, couple of days, and um, I wish you um, well in your deliberations and delighted that you could all be here. So thank you again very much, and I will ha now hand over to Julian. Thank you. Hi, yes, good, good morning. I'm, I'm Julian Brooks, uh, curator in the Department of Drawings here at the Getty and uh, co-curator of the exhibition, Andre Del Sarto, The Renaissance Workshop in Action. And uh, I just wanted to extend my own uh, welcome to you this morning as well. It's really super to see so many of you here. And uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers. I'm just thrilled that they could all make it, and uh, I'm really looking forward to their papers. Uh, I'll now pass over to, um, hand over to uh, Carmen Bambach, who really needs no introduction. Um, she's a curator in the Department of Drawings at, and Prints at the Met, and uh, one of the, the titans of our field. You know, who, who can forget her huge uh, Leonardo da Vinci catalog from a few years ago? And of course, she's working on a similar um, uh, uh, sort of monster on uh, Michelangelo. So we'll look forward to that. But, um, and Carmen will be moderating this morning's session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful that everybody has come. I see so many friends and colleagues. Um, I would like to congratulate Julian not only for a fabulously, a beautifully arresting exhibition, but also for the innovation as far as an exhibition is concerned. 20 years ago, the word workshop or workshop practice was barely discussed. Workshop, in fact, was one of those words that connoisseurs used in passing to demote drawings that were considered not worthy of the hand of the master. So the very fact that this word has made it into the title of an exhibition is really extraordinary. The other elegant aspect is the way that Julian has integrated very complex scientific information in a very succinct way, very clear for the general public. So I think that this exhibition makes a contribution on two counts, two very, very important um, aspects. One, that for advancing the scholarship, but two, and really perhaps even more important, the sense that one can engage an audience in speaking about the practices of an artist 
uh, Julien has used the word secrets that are revealed. This is really quite extraordinary. So bravo, Julien. Our first... Thank you. Our first speaker is Hugo Chapman, and he is the Simon Sainsbury Keeper of Prints and Drawings at the British Museum. And Hugo was the curator of the Michelangelo exhibition, uh, Michelangelo Drawings Closer to the Master, and co-curator with Marzia Fayetti of Fra Angelico to Leonardo in 2010. Um, Additionally, Hugo has co-curated an exhibition on metal point drawings, which is about to open, I think, Tuesday, if I'm not wrong, at the British Museum. And so congratulations, Hugo. The title of Hugo's paper is Andrea del Sarto and the Eclipse of Metal Point. Thank you very much, Carmen, and, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I really said that I would give a, a talk to Julian as he twisted my arm energetically. I said that I really didn't have any, uh, now as head of uh, prints and drawings, I had no time for any original research, and uh, I really had to kind of put everything uh, into the Silver Point show. So um, I have to squeeze Andrea Del Sarto into what I know about, which is... Uh, of the show on metal points, but uh, I hope there were interesting things uh, to, to discuss. But of course, Andrea Del Sarto didn't make uh, any uh, silver point drawings. And I guess one of the premises of, of, of the metal point show, Silver and Gold in London, is to think why Italian artists stopped using uh, metal point. That is a technique where you use a thin rod of soft metal, normally silver, on a prepared surface with a slightly abrasive ground that takes a tiny trace of that metal to create a line. And so here we have uh, on the screen uh, two examples of rather similar types of drawings. On the right is uh, Raphael, where he's composing very rapidly using silver point on a prepared surface from the so-called pink sketchbook. And on the left, uh, of also Andrea del Sarto in two colors chalks, uh, drawing figural ideas, but uh, obviously uh, Raphael is using silver point, Andrea del Sarto is not. And if one looks at the Raphael, what he has uh, in his mind is another great uh, Florentine artist, and that is uh, Leonardo da Vinci, with this marvelous drawing uh, from uh, the Royal Collection in Windsor, where you see very much Leonardo's uh, background in uh, Verrocchio's studio where he's used to thinking of sculptural form and he's turning uh, a figure, maybe not even a figure in front of him, but just in his mind, he's turning uh, this bust of a woman, rotating her and drawing her in a continuous way. And that's really what the, the great quality of silver point is. Unlike a pen, uh, you, you don't have to stop to charge it with ink. Even chalk, you have to sharpen its tip. With, with, a, with a metal point stylus, you can just draw, and it follows every gesture of your hand and your wrist. Um, so um, I suppose it opens the question as to why Andrea del Sarto does not uh, use metal point, particularly because there's a very good reason for thinking that he was instructed in it uh, as a young artist. So uh, we know that he joins in the mid 1490s, the studio of Piero di Cosimo, the Florentine painter, and there's good reason to think that Piero di Cosimo, uh, like most Florentine artists of his generation, was a metal point uh, draftsman, and this uh, beautiful drawing under the care of Carmen in, in, in the Met, I think has a very good claim to be by Piero di Cosimo, because both the type uh, of, 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 of the woman uh, and, and her, the inclination of her head is very close to this painting uh, in Strasbourg. So the likelihood is that Andrea del Sarto was um, brought up with a, uh, to, to draw uh, with a stylus. Um, and indeed, just the time that he's, he's training, there are, there are other artists in, in Florence who are still uh, continuing 
to draw in metal point. So on the left, one of the great uh, metal point artists, uh, Filipino Lippi, uh, who Carmen and, and George Golder in the Met did a, a fantastic show about. Uh, and on the right, his pupil, Raffaellino del Garbo, another example of a silver point drawings. All of these done um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and you would have thought if you'd arrived in Florence at that time that metal point really was, um, you know, was, was, was full of energy. Lots of artists were doing it uh, and that it was going to continue. And um, we've seen, well, with this, with the, um, the drawing on the left, uh, is Lippi just drawing uh, a new, two nudes in the, in the studio. In fact, he's using uh, silver point on the left and on the right he's using lead point. Uh, but he's also using it in the next slide for exploring uh, figural ideas for particular compositions. So here he is uh, working out the two, the poses of the two litter bearers in the uh, fresco in the uh, Strozzi Chapel in Santa Maria Novella, this drawing uh, from the Uffizi. And uh, I think one of the, uh, the beauties of looking at drawing, and, and, uh, and I think part of the excitement of seeing this fantastic Andrea del Sarto, the, the secrets that Carmen's referred to, is again that you do see the inner workings of a Florentine painting workshop. So uh, we've seen this drawing before. This is the Raffaele del Garbo. Uh, he's preparing the figure of the risen Christ for this altarpiece now in the Academia, but struck by the kind of the beauty, the lithe, adolescent form of the, of the assistant who's posing for the figure of Christ, he turns him, at the same time that he's thinking of him as, as, as the, a Christ-like figure, he's also thinking this figure reminds me of classical sculpture, so he um, um, reveals uh, his, his genitals, he puts a, a, a garland on his, on his head. So he is both Christ and Bacchus at the same time. And of course, that could never go into the final painting. I mean, you, you would have been sort of stoned. You would have been burnt to death. But in the secret of, of a studio, these two, two coming together of the pagan and the Christian world could coexist. Um, and so one really does see uh, these sort of secret moments of, of studio life. And there are other um, artists of the generation of, um, of Andrea del Sarto who are using uh, silver points. So, for example, uh, here is uh, uh, a drawing which I think has a very good claim to be by Fra Bartolomeo. Um, and many, many years ago, um, uh, Everett Fay from, from, from the Metropolitan uh, linked it uh, to this painting in Rimini uh, which was uh, painted by Domenico Galandaio, the master of Fra Bartolomeo, but then Galandaio dies, leaves it unfinished. And the um, assumption is, and a, a good claim, that Fra Bartolomeo finished it off. Now, personally, I'm never absolutely certain that this drawing is, is related to it, because it, does, it seems to me that the, uh, the draperies aren't so alike. But uh, having said that, uh, this is, I think, um, pretty certainly is by Fra Bartolomeo early on in his, uh, in his uh, career in the, in the mid-1490s. And especially if you look uh, at the reverse of it, uh, these figures are very typical of, of Fra Bartolomeo. Um, so I think it is a case of him drawing in metal point. Um, and, but if, if we go on a little bit further in his career, Fra Bartolomeo too, he gives up using metal point. So when he wants to do... Um, Drapery studies, he either turns to uh, uh, chalk, as in the one on the left, or on the right, uh, this uh, magnificent example of drawing in a, in a kind of aqueous distemper on linen, a technique that, uh, in fact, is, um, starts off in, in Gerlandio and, and Barocchio's workshops and is used uh, most famously uh, by Leonardo. But he doesn't return. Uh, to, 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 to metal point, really uh, because metal point, uh, as uh, uh, Italian artists become more interested in chiaroscuro, in, the diff in these dramatic contrasts between, between light and shade, the very tight tonality of metal point really doesn't suit that. It is not a tonal medium, it is a linear medium. 
And so if you want, wants to study um, uh, dramatic lighting effects, uh, metal point uh, is not uh, the technique uh, that um, favors that. But although we've, we've uh, so far been looking at Florentine drawings, um, metal point does actually, uh, and Florence is, by the second half of the, of the 15th century, is really the center of metal point drawing. It is the place where disegno in all that types of drawing and, and thinking about drawing Florence dominates it. But it also ripples out as artists um, are um, sort of uh, brought in to, to use it. So Perugino is an example of an artist who comes from Umbria in central Italy, but he's trained in Barocco's workshop alongside uh, Leonardo, and he gets trained to use metal point. And here is an example uh, from the British Museum where he's studying the head of the, the apostle on the far right of this altarpiece uh, now uh, in, in Lyon. Uh, he's using metal point uh, on a, uh, a, a colored ground. And really the end, the, the, the final figure in the, in the history of metal point in Italy is Raphael uh, here on the left. Um, and he picks up metal point as do many, else, many other artists in Umbria because of Perugino's championing of it. And in a way to understand uh, the new style of Perugino, artists are adopting his manner of drawing uh, and that's metal point uh, in order to kind of comprehend and analyze his style. And uh, Raphael is a fantastic uh, um, practitioner of metal point. And as you probably will recognize, this is a study for a painting very close at hand here in Pasadena, uh, the Norton Simon Madonna. And you get really what Raphael brings to metal point is this you know, beautiful sense of geometry, the way that the oval of the head is echoed by the oval of the, of the veil, which is then echoed by the oval of, the, um, of her brooch. This beautiful flowing sense uh, and, the, and the kind of complementary forms, uh, feeling for abstract form that is at the heart of, of Raphael's qualities as a draftsman. And Raphael really ends uh, the section that I'm involved in in this show um, because after 1520 when he dies, that's pretty much it for Metal Point in Italy. Um, so the top, the top three are all examples. Well, all of those drawings are in the British Museum from this so-called pink sketchbook that he does um, some, somewhere uh, around 15, 10, 11, 12 in Rome. Um, and he's doing it for a variety of different reasons. So. Uh, a sort of beautiful crystalline example on the left of the Virgin and Child. The center one is a, a new drawing that's emerged, uh, which is uh, based on a, a Roman cameo showing Ajax the Lesser pulling Cassandra off a sculpture in order to rape her during this, the sack of Troy, so based on the antique. And then on the one on the right, we've already looked at this sort of free-flowing one, but also uh, the bottom one, which is not in the show because there wasn't space, is uh, him uh, thinking about designs for uh, figural poses for the Parnassus in the uh, Stanza della Senatura. So a real variety of uses that Raphael uh, is, is bringing to Metal Point. But even he, after around 1515, really, uh, as far as we know, seems to give up uh, Metal Point and use it no more. Another example, um, oops, uh, uh, um, but I suppose the, um, an example of an artist, you know, who's one of the kind of principal reasons why uh, uh, metal point dies out is, 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 is Michelangelo. Uh, and uh, his master, Galandio, is, is a great master of metal point. Uh, the, one, the drawing on the left is by Galandio. Uh, Michelangelo, like Andrea del Sarto, must have been instructed in drawing in, in, in metal point, but it, there are no drawings by him, uh, none survive, uh, and he, he seems to have totally rejected it uh, as, uh, as an artist later in his career. And so even, uh, even in cases where you could possibly use a silver point, so this very kind of crystalline purity uh, of the, the, uh, the drawing on the right, this ideal head, that would have been very well suited to turning into a, 
a metal point drawing uh, that kind of precision about it. But Michelangelo wants nothing to do with metal point. He uses chalk for it, very, very finely sharpened chalk. Um, and because Michelangelo is the kind of the great uh, model uh, for Florentine artists, his uh, you know refusal to use metal points is really followed by the generation of Andrea del Sarto. I think if Michelangelo had adopted uh, metal point later on, it probably would have gone on much longer, but he didn't. Um, another example of, of, of the way that metal point ripples out from France is, of course, um, is uh, Leonardo. Leonardo goes to Milan uh, in the early 80s, and he, for the first time, has to instruct pupils in how uh, to become painters, and he teaches them, uh, he teaches them metal point, a, 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 a drawing technique that had died out in northern Italy uh, for a couple of generations. But these, and I feel rather kind of sorry for these poor old Milanese artists who probably had never ever gone near a silver stylus. Suddenly they were being, you know, told this is how you become like me, um, uh, and they had to get down to it. Uh, and when they weren't stealing each other's uh, styluses, which also happened, um, they, they drew. Um, and so on the left is an example from the, uh, from, again from Windsor Castle in the, in, the, uh, in the exhibition. And to the right of it is a drawing by uh, his most gifted pupil, Boltraffio. And you see that Boltraffio really has understood uh, and even uh, come close to mastering the incredible precision, the incredible... Uh, um, um, sort of uh, analytical power that Leonardo has, but also artists who hadn't been um, taught directly by uh, Leonardo. So that on the on the far right is an anonymous Milanese artist known as the Master of the Palace, Forzesca. Uh, he probably wasn't uh, directly taught by Leonardo, but in order to try and sort of understand how Leonardo worked, he he adopts drawing in silver point. And so Leonardo causes a kind of a brief uh, kind of renaissance of, of, of metal point in northern Italy. But even Leonardo, uh, uh, by the, the mid-1490s, has given up uh, metal point, and that kind of moment of metal point drawing in Milan dies. And of course, uh, you know, when one thinks of Andrea del Sarto, one thinks of him as really a, a chalk uh, an artist in, in, in chalk, and I, I guess the kind of the key moment in, 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 in all of that generation is the return of Leonardo and Michelangelo uh, to Florence in the early years of the 16th century in order to do these two uh, battle uh, paintings, uh, which both of which were never realized, but there were these amazing drawings that come out of it. So top left, you have the Leonardo in red chalk, and then on the right, this magnificent uh, drawing uh, by um, uh, Michelangelo uh, for one of the soldiers in, in black chalk. And these were the kind of the large scale drawings, very much where you can see what you can do in chalk. If you press harder, you get a, a deeper line where you can shade it with the side of your finger. You know, the tonality of chalk, these are qualities you do not get. Uh, in, in, in metal point. And this is really kind of at the heart of why metal point um, dies out because this is the direct, the new direction of high Renaissance art is towards uh, this much more kind of dynamic style which does not suit uh, metal point. But I mean, what's curious, I suppose, about Andrea del Sarto uh, looking at the show is whereas, um, you know, both Michelangelo and Leonardo, when they're, when they're preparing uh, their compositions, they, like most Italian artists, uh, like you know, sort of 99.9% .9 of Italian artists, they pick up a pen, you know, a quill pen, and they draw out very quickly their ideas using the kind of the dynamism of, 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 of ink. Uh, it's the way that it kind of encourages the rhythm to, to kind of invent new ideas. Um, and this kind of drawing, that sort of first idea type of drawing, is really you know, dominated by pen and ink drawings. But, um, of course, when we go to the show, uh, we see Andrea del Sarto doing that type of uh, compositional study, but he does it in chalk. 
Um, and of course, you know, that's rather perplexing. And uh, we kind of, as art historians and, stu uh, and students of, of drawing, think, you know, why? Why is he doing that? Um, you know, we come up with elaborate ideas and, and um, uh, you know, premises. Uh, but in the end, it's really, I think, um, you know, artists have their predilections for a particular kind of technique. And sometimes there are underlying reasons why you would choose something, one technique over another. But sometimes I think one just has to admit you just have no idea why they do it. And it would be sort of um, a mistake to, to, to think there is an underlying logic. Um, and I think... Um, you know, that's also true of why Andrea del Sarto sometimes picks up a red chalk, sometimes picks up a black chalk. I mean, there are examples, and I think uh, the wonderful show here shows you that Andrea del Sarto, who we think of very much as a, a red chalk artist, in fact, draws uh, often in black chalk. And there are times when you can see, ah, he's drawing in black chalk for this reason. But, you know, how do you explain it? On the same sheet of paper, he's drawing in red chalk and he's drawing in black chalk. Is it because, you know, he went out for lunch and, you know, <laughs> afterwards picked up a piece of black chalk? Um, or, you know, he... Who knows? I mean, it's very difficult to explain it. Um, and just to sort of prove the unfathomability of artists sometimes is... Um, this artist, Giacconi, not an artist, you don't have to beat yourself up if you've never heard of Giacconi, because he's a very obscure artist. But we know from Vasari's um, um, description uh, that Giacconi was a very close associate and friend of Andrea del Sarto. So you would think he's in the studio. He would have seen Andrea del Sarto drawing mainly in, in chalk. But, as you know... 90%, 95% of all Giacconi's drawings are in pen and ink, a technique that, that um, Andrea del Sarto really does not use very much at all. So how to explain this? I, I stand before you looking perplexed, but I just think we should be too careful uh, to always to think that we art historians have the answer uh, to, to why artists choose a uh, particular uh, media. Um, so, this is the show that I've shamelessly plied for the last... Uh, uh, I mean, you know. Flights to London are very... Uh, uh, but I guess at the heart, for, for me, I mean, what was so interesting about... I mean, while I, I, I knew the history of Metal Point in Italy, when you started to look through six centuries of Metal Point and you began to ask yourself... Why is it that Metal Point dies in Italy in 1520 but goes on all the way to the end of the 17th century north of the Alps? I mean, that is a question I never really asked myself. Um, but putting the show together, I think I could, we've come up with some ideas, um, of which I'll float with you now. Um, so Metal Point drawing in, in, is dominated by France, as I've already said. And it's really, for Florentine artists, Drawing, drawing in metal point, is something you do in the studio. And it is about drawing the figure. Uh, so here we have Fra Filippo Lippi and two examples uh, by his son. Um, and it's as if you picked up the stylus when you went into the studio, and at the end of the day, when work was over, you put down the stylus. Um, and uh, that's true also uh, Elsewhere, so Boltrafio, we've already seen this is a drawing by Spagna, Lo Spagna, who's a, 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 a follower of Perugino in Umbria. And the only exception to that, as you know, as is often the case, uh, is, is Leonardo, who realizes that what Metal Point offers you, because once you have your coated paper, you can go out and you can make your drawing anywhere. Uh, it's you know, you don't need to bring ink with you. You don't need to sharpen your chalk. You just go out and you can draw um, wherever, in any environment. And this is an example of Leonardo in Milan making drawings. Uh, I don't suspect, although Carmen could tell me that I'm wrong, I don't suspect that he brought a horse into the studio. He went out to where the horse was and he drew. But as is so often the case, Leonardo's example is not one that was taken up uh, by other artists. And the other, you know, thing that you, when you look at 
uh, Italian metal point drawings, is they are of individuals. You know, I think, you know, Los Spaniards drawing is of a model. The beautiful youth that we've looked at by Raffaellino del Garbo had a name, as the Lorenzo di Credi on the right had a name, but none of that is ever, ever recorded. They are just bodies. They are just forms. They are just a means of studying a particular pose or for practicing uh, how to uh, capture light and shade in metal point. They are not individuals. Um, and that is very, very different when you cross north of the Alps. And really, it pains me to say it, but as an Italian specialist, but actually it, the northern European artists took metal point to a place that, that Italians didn't. And that was because they realized um, that you could draw outside the studio. And also, the key thing about metal point drawings is that it's a very durable media because you coat the paper uh, in, a, in a preparation. So these drawings can be passed around and they last. Um, and so, for example, the only drawing that we have by Roger van der Weyden is a, is a, is a metal point drawing. The only drawing by Jan van, Jan van Eyck is a metal point drawing. And so, as a way, a kind of a form of uh, recording uh, the world around you, Metal Point was very, very well suited to that. So here we have uh, Hans Holbein the Elder, the father, the father of the, the well-known Holbein who came to the court of Henry VIII. He made many, many Metal Point um, drawings, and he recorded the names of these people. So we know that this is a portrait of his brother Sigmund on the left, and this, my God, if you're ever going to, you know, Produce a, uh, what a banker should look like. I mean, that, that is, you know, the <laughs> Jakob Fugger, Jakob the Rich, this amazingly powerful, rich banker from Augsburg. And we know what he looks like because he's, uh, the name is inscribed above. And that um, continues uh, in, in Holland in the, in, the, in the late 16th century. Uh, so uh, on the right, you have Goltzius. Uh, recording his features and this exquisite self-portrait where he's presenting himself as this sort of successful uh, artist uh, with a copper plate in his hand, or his pupil Jakob de Gein. He's there present when Prince Moritz dies. And what does he do? He whips out his, his silver point sketchbook and he makes a drawing of him. So it is about memory. Um, and that really continues all the way through uh, when uh, metal point revives, it really dies in the, um, at the end of the 17th century, but it comes back in the 19th century. And so Nevinson, as a young artist on the top left, recording his features, he does so in, 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 in metal point. Or uh, on the far right, Holman Hunt recording uh, his son's features, or the American artist Joseph Stella in metal point. And at the same time, I think, as that idea of memorialization through this durable media, is also the idea that you, the moment you pick up a metal point, you are joining a lineage that stretches back to Leonardo, to Raphael, to Roger van der Weyden, to Holbein, to Dürer, all of these people. Um, it is very much um, you know, that you are aware of that history. Um, and another feature um, is, is recording the world around you, which is another uh, comes out uh, in these great drawings that Dürer produces when he goes to the Netherlands in the fifth, early 1520s. He takes with him a metal point sketchbook and he tells us what he's drawing. You know, he likes this dog who he meets in Aachen, so he makes a drawing of it. He wants to record what the, the minster uh, of Aachen looks like from uh, an upstairs window. He does so in metal point. And even, you know, something really quite sort of prosaic, a, a kind of uh, the design of a table and some tableware, he does it uh, in, 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 in metal point. Uh, and that continues uh, later on with Goltzius on the left with uh, record, you know, making a little sketch of his dog uh, of this exotic, and little did he realize what a terrible mistake it was, tobacco plant growing in his garden. Um, and on the right, and this is you know, the fact that, as far as we know, Rembrandt makes only three metal point drawings. Um, and they are all related to a trip that he makes to Friesland to ask the hand of uh, Saskia van Eulenburg. So it's, a, it's this key episode in his life, and he wants to record it and keep it because he's going to draw in metal point. 
And maybe one of the, for me, the most, one of the most poignant drawings is the, the one on the far right is, is Otto Dix. That's a, a landscape made in, in 1934. And Otto Dix begins to draw in metal point precisely at the moment when he is um, being criticized by the Nazis and after 1933 described as a degenerate artist. He loses his post at the Dresden Academy. He takes his family right down to southern Germany in Randegg. And, um, you know, he awaits, you know, perhaps annihilation. Um, but in order to, to, I think, to declare that he does, despite what the Nazis are saying, he is a German artist, he's going to use the technique of Holbein and Dürer. He's going to draw in, in metal point, And he's going to record things that are going to perhaps uh, be annihilated, like the Jewish cemetery in the center there in Randegg with these sort of dark, oppressive clouds uh, above it. So very much, I mean, sort of uh, the idea of memory and metal point, which is not an aspect at all you get uh, in Italian drawings. So I want to end not criticizing Andrea da Sarto, because my God, you know, he's the most wonderful artist, uh, um, and this exhibition is, is an absolute triumph for showcasing it. But here is a drawing that if Andrea del Sarto was, you know, Andrea of Nuremberg or Augsburg, he would have probably done in silver point. And we would have known the name of this woman, who is clearly an individual. We think that she's a, a Maria, a Maria del, del Fedo, a Maria di Beretoio, but we, don't re, we, we will not know her name. Um, but, you know, uh, Italian artists used metal point in a particular way, in a rather limited way, and thus it ceased to have relevance. It ceased to have, it became a kind of anachronism. And so I think, you know, as a, a, a lover of, of, of metal point drawings, I, you know, I'm, I regret that Andrea del Sarto uh, did not uh, take it up. Uh, but when one looks at drawings like this, one really cannot criticize him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo, for a very illuminating and eloquent uh, presentation. Our next speaker is Alessandro Cecchi, and he is the former director of the Galleria Palatina in Florence. He has published numerous articles and essays on Italian Renaissance art. He is author of a monograph on Botticelli. He is a co-author of Andrea del Sarto, Catalogo Completo, and is one of the principal authors of Andrea del Sarto, the beautiful exhibition in Florence in 1486. And he also did a, a groundbreaking exhibition of the Officina della Maniera in 1996. And Alessandro's um, talk today is um, entitled Andrea del Sarto and the Siege of Florence. Join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Cecchi. Ten days after the sack of Rome, which began on May 6, 1527, with Pope Clement VII's flight to Castel Sant'Angelo, the Medici abandoned Florence and the Republic was proclaimed under the dictates reminiscent of the Dominican preacher Savonarola. Very quickly, and with unshakable faith, Florence was placed under the protection of Christ the King. This is the frieze by Baccio D'Agnolo that is today under the main door of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence with a dedication to Christ King of Florence. This divine protection became all the more necessary and called upon after the June 29th, 1529 Treaty of Barcelona, committing the Holy Roman Emperor Charles I to provide any and all military assistance to the Pope in order to retake the city and reinstall the Medici in Florence. From that point, the love of the newly regained freedom and its defense at all costs became the life motive in any official Florentine document or statement, such as that made by the Signoria to the Venetian spokesman, Carlo Capello, in August 1529, 
we will not only stand up for our liberties, but we ourselves are prepared to die with weapons in hand and the city wall defense of this homeland. The fortification of the city, which uh, with new ramparts able to withstand the devastating blows of the artillery, was accomplished under Michelangelo's direction, who had been appointed governor general for fortification on April 6, 1529. The citizens were divided into those who remained and those who sought safety for, by fleeing the city or by not going back to it. Even Michelangelo himself experienced a moment of confusion and fear for his life. On September 21st, 1529, he abandoned the city at the height of the work, only to return to Florence from Venice by November 23rd at the persuasion of his friends. Among the most painful and difficult measure taken at that time was the destruction of the villages and monasteries within a mile of the city walls, resulting in heavy losses to the city artistic patrimony. While frescoes in other monasteries were being destroyed, only the Last Supper by Andrea del Sarto in the Vallobrosan Monastery of San Salvi escaped destruction. According to Vasari, the gritty beauty of the work prevented the Florentines from, from destroying it during an assault outside the walls that took place in April 1530. Things did not go as well for the marble relief by Benedetto da Rovezzano, destined for the unfinished tomb of San Giovanni Gualberto, St. John Gualbert, which were left at the mercy of the enemy and vandalized by the imperial troops. Vasari affirms that even Andrea's tabernacle with the Madonna and Child and the young St. John, close to the new, now destroyed Porta Pinti, seems to have been saved, judging for the large number of copies that are known and that were made during the 16th century. Early in the siege in October 1529, a number of citizens, artists, and patrons had taken refuge in Pisa, as did the then 18 years old Vasari and the sculptor Silvio Cosini. Others, such as Pierfrancesco Borgherini, found hospitality in the inviting Republic of Lucca. Pierfrancesco left his wife Margherita Ciaioli to defend the paintings in the famous bridal chamber at his palace in Borgo Santi Apostoli from the rapacity of Battista della Palla, agent to King Francis I of France. Among these works were the two stories of Joseph the Ebreu by Del Sarto, now in the Palatine Gallery at the Pitti Palace. In accordance with the Pope's wishes and at risk of his own life, Ottaviano dei Medici remained in the city along with other citizens who, like him, the state considers suspicious. He suffered heavy losses and from October 13, 1529, he spent several months shut up inside the Palazzo della Signoria. On the eve of this imprisonment, the Medici allowed Andrea de Sarto to dispose of the Madonna and Child, <coughs> young St. John the Baptist and St. Elizabeth. Florence Palatine Gallery, which is an exhibition, which the Del Sarto had painted for Ottaviano and which was unable to fetch. Vasari writes, when he had finished this painting, Andrea brought it to Messer Ottaviano, but because of the siege of Florence, 
Ottaviano had other things on his mind. He told him he should give it to whomever would like it. Thought he excused himself and thanked Andrea effusively. All Andrea said in reply was, the labor was endured for you and yours will be always be. Sell it, replied Messer Ottaviano, and use the money for yourself because I know what I am saying. Thereupon, Andrea left and went home. Notwithstanding all the requests made to him, he never let anyone have the painting. Instead, when the siege was over and the Medici had returned to Florence, he brought it back to Messer Ottaviano, who accepted it very willingly, thanked Andrea and paid him the double for it. Even Zanobi di Giovan Battista Bracci, who commissioned the only family today in the Palatine Gallery, was arrested in Santa Maria del Fiore and sent to the Stink prison on April 22, 1530, for having helped his brother Lorenzo flee from Florence on February 18 of the same year. In addition to Del Sarto and his collaborators Bernardo del Buda, Francesco Salviati and Nannoccio da San Giorgio, the other artists who had remained in the city were Pontormo and Bronzino, the young Benvenuto Cellini for some time in the ranks of the Florentine militia and guard and later moving over to the side of the Pope, and Benvenuto della Volpaia, and il Trivolo, who at night in secret at, and at grand, great peril constructed a model in cork or wood of the city of Florence and its defenses, which was secretly taken out of Florence and brought to the Pope, and of which both Varchi and Vasari speak. At the time, Cristofano Gerardi called Il Doceno from Borgo San Sepolcro, future artist and collaborator with Vasari in the Palazzo Vecchio, was in the ranks of the mercenaries paid by the Republic. He hoped to have time to draw and study the beauties of Florence, something that was impossible due to his military duties. From the second half of October 1529, the imperial troops and the papal troops were encamped in the hills, on the hills of the Oltrarno. And uh, as can be seen in the famous fresco by Stradano, in the hall of Clement VII, in the Leo X quarter in, of Palazzo Vecchio, and which was based on surveys made by Vasari. Alto the emperor and the pope had an enormous problem in paying their German, Spanish, and Italian troops, who were always close to desertion, Florence undertook any and all measures and sacrifice to find the money needed to pay the, ten, the thousand of men who fought at his service under the command of Malatesta Baglioni. An even greater uproar was caused by the betrayal of three mercenary captains, Cecco and Jacopo Antonio Orsini and Giovanni da Sessa, who, with their troops, deserted to enemy ranks on February the 2nd, 1530. One morning at dawn, when they were outside the Porta San Gallo to accompany the peasants and sackmen, baggage servants, while they gathered wood, writes Varchi, and each of the three captains had an exile edict placed upon him with a price on each head of 500 gold florins brought in alive and 300 if dead. Their likenesses were made into stuffed cloth dummies and they were hanged by a foot on the street in the garden of San Miniato with their faces turned toward the Giramonte Hills, with two inscriptions written in large letters for each, one at the foot with the name and surname of each, and one at the head that read for deserter, thief, and traitor. In addition to their images were painted on the facade 
on the mercancia near Via della Condotta, where you can still see the white and the name of the Andrea de Sarto disciple, Bernardo Buda, crossed out. This, in fact, was paid by Andrea, but he didn't want to create hostility toward himself and become known as the painter of the hanged man. The paintings were so lifelike and natural that anyone who had seen them once, uh, even once immediately recognized them. On the same day, the ten of peace and liberty, the judiciary in charge for the war and foreign affairs, wrote to the Florentine ambassadors with uh, the Pope in Bologna. So, led by traitors and deceivers, having always been treated as good and better men who did not deserve these qualities. We will not fail to carry out to the fullest whatever is needed because one of them had even be paid his company wages up to the last evening. On February the 7th, Galeotto Giugni, spokesman in Ferrara, was informed of the measures taken. We inflicted on them all the disgrace and dishonor possible. We tagged them as traitors and deceivers and painted them through, throughout the city in the very worst ways imaginable. On February the 10th, the sculptor Sandro Di Lorenzo was paid for the cloth effigies of the three captains hanged by one foot and placed on the San Miniato ramparts facing the enemy. And the painter Giovanni di Anton Francesco was paid for painting the six written inscriptions. On April the 4th, the painter Bernardo di Girolamo called the Buddha was paid for having frescoes the images of the three desertan and traitors capitans. Andrea wanted his collaborator to be credited for the defamatory paintings, just as Andrea del Castagno had been after the victory of Anghiari in 1440, and Sandro Botticelli after the Pezzi conspiracy in 1478. Vasari tells us that Andrea assisted in at last his design, if not the execution, of wax models of the traitors, capitans by Il Tribolo, as evidenced in four drawings in the Gabinetto di Segna e Stampe degli Uffizi and the Chatsworth drawing, all drawn in red chalk on white paper. The Uffizi three 329F appears to have been the first of the series in order of execution. The figure of the traitor captain is strung up by his right leg and is depicted nude so as the better to, to, to better study the anatomy of a, the an unnatural pose of a man upside down with his head dangling in space. The next phase is documented on sheet 330F, the, on the left, where the same figure, again angled by the right leg, is flaying and is clothed in a jacket and in a panned breeches. Sheet 331F, as drawings on the front of the back of the page and include a number of studies of a figure hanging by the left hand with his clothes falling down to cover part of the torso with outstretched arms. Another figure strung up by his left leg is a drawing 328F, a study which is more defined as are the two studies on the sheet from the the English collection, the Chesso collection, with the same motif of the edges of garments dropping down due to the pull of gravity on the body. Sixteen gonfalons from the four quarter of Florence, four for each quarter, were mastered along with the professional soldiers. All Florentine men capable of bearing arms had been placed under the command of an experienced military man, Stefano Colonna, 
da Palestrina, who was before at the service of the King Francis I of France and who came from, Florence, from France to serve the Republic. Here he is portrayed many years later by Bronzino when he was commander of the personal guard to Duke Cosimo I of the Medici. The Florentine militia and guard, as they were called, also enlisted many young men who sought every opportunity to go out to fight, despite the fact that the, their primary duties were to maintain internal order and garrison the wall and ramparts, especially during the night when the mercenary troop, troops were resting. Among them was Francesco di Giovanni di Gerardo Guardi, who, from my research, was born on April 29, 1514, and therefore would, would have been only 16 years old at the time of the siege. An age considered perfectly compatible to serve the homeland, just as Zanardi had written when mentioning the very young militia men, not reaching the age of 15 or 16 years. According to Vasari, Pontormo had portrayed him dressed as a soldier in the painting from this collection, erroneously held to be a portrait of Cosimo I of the Medici, while he stand the night watch on a rampart that could be the one built close to his family holdings near the Porta San Giorgio. The paint of the cover of that portrait is by Bronzino and depicts the myth of Pygmalion and Galatea today in the Uffizi, which was probably chosen, chosen as an auspice that Florence would defeat their enemies and free the city from siege, just as the artist Pygmalion, enamored of his creation, had seen Galatea come to life by the intention of the goddess Aphrodite. Even Andrea del Sarto must have been involved in this type of warrior-like portraits in which the Florentine Borgosi and nobles were shown armed and ready to defend their liberty. The Uffizi sheet uh, 326 F drawn in black pencil on white paper shows a full-length figure of a young man with a def defiant bearing, his left hand on his hip and uh, the right resting on the hilt of a sword. It is evident from the squaring that cuts the figure in three quarters that he was a preparatory study for a portrait as the Guardi portrait and other from this period, including an anonymous portrait by Pontormo, perhaps depicting Carlo Neroni, which is in deposit, is a private co collection uh, property, and deposited at the national, in exhibit at the National Gallery in London. During the siege, and, and Del Sarto lived in his house, built with the money from the King of France, or in his workshop, or, or other suitable place to all these works. He still had with him the Panciatichi Assumption, Florence Palatine Gallery, which had never been sent to Lyon because of problems of the seasoning of the wood used by Baccio Daniel in the panel support, and which Vasari mentioned. Also, him, also with him was the Poppy Altarpiece, in the Palatine Gallery, still to be finished, the lost cartoons for the tapestries for, with the Council of the Guilds for the Republican Signoria, and the works commissioned by Battista della Palla for the King of France, specifically the Washington DC charity, and the sacrifice of Isaac in Dresden along with some other smaller works for private clients, not listed by Vasari. After the surrender of the city in August 12, 1530, 
Vasari recounts that some of the Lansnecht mercenaries brought the plague into the city and Andrea became infected, or at least he thought he was. It was uh, to no avail that prior to the decision on February 2nd, 1529, Andrea had entered the company near the Nunziata dedicated to San Sebastiano, so often invoked against the terrible scourge. Perhaps for devotion, Andrea painted for the company a lost image, destined to have a remarkable reputation judged by the many copies and versions that were made of it. And so, either from his qualms about this being stricken by the plague or through his irregular eating, after suffering several, several during the siege of right Vasari, Andrea one day fell seriously ill, and after having taken to his bed in dire straits, find no cure for his illness, and badly neglected since his wife, from fear of the plague, kept far away as she could, he died, they say, with scarcely anyone aware of it. On his deathbed, on September 28, 1530, at the age of 44, and as the god and generous person he was, Del Sarto wanted to make a codicil to his will. He left to the hospital a house to use as painter workshop with a garden that is attached to the home of the said Andrea. He provided that his value should constitute a dowry for his stepdaughter, the 17 Maria di Carlo del Berrettaio, the cap maker, born from this wife, Lucrezia del Fede, first marriage. The painter had been isolated at home. Today, the Sucari house, with the great scandal of the Florentines, that, that uh, for, was a sacrilege for, for, for the Florentines, that the Sucari could acquire the house of, of Sarto, on the corner of Via Capponi and Via Giusti, and there is uh, on the Via Capponi uh, an inscription that remembers that uh, that was the house of uh, Sarto. The painter was, was, uh, had been insulated at home, away from his beloved wife. His last wishes were heard from the other side of the door of the ground floor room by the chaplain from Santa Maria del Fiore, and in presence of several witnesses, including two survived friars and the painter Tommaso di Stefano Lunetti. I, said Zanobi, heard and recognized the voice of Said Andrea, who was in the ground floor room. I took his confession from the doorway, the bedroom being next to the doorway. I truly and faithfully make this codicil by my own hand on this day and month named above. Said witnesses also heard the voice and they also stood at the doorway and they did not see Said Andrea, but said it was the voice of Andrea. Thank you. Thank you.